I've got it. I've got the video you've been waiting for. The history of Crack the Sky, or as we're calling it, Joe Macri's Cracked Memories. And it's good. It's real good. But there are a few caveats. First, the history revealed concerns the formation of Crack the Sky, the first three albums, the first three tours, and basically up to the release of White Music. And the reason for this is Joe Macri left the band about 1980. He rejoined around 2000 and left again in 2010 due to health concerns. But all is well, and the history Joe reveals is really fun to listen to. You're going to enjoy this one. Joey was... I knew him. We went to first grade together. I mean, I, you know, I knew him, and I we used to go up to his house uh, from St. Anthony's grade school. When the Beatles come out, he got this Ludwig set. He got Ringo's drum set. So wow. I go up to eat a sandwich for lunch, and he sits down and starts playing Ringo. Wow. You know, Beatles songs. And I was like, okay, I'm getting a guitar. I'm going to start taking lessons. And then that kind of what started it for me. So we knew each other. We worked together. We were very close you know and no it just you know that chem that's chemistry yeah that's just the way about it is. chemistry when when i listen to early crack the sky it's almost as, as if the guitar rick wakowski is almost part of the rhythm section was that a result because he's also a drummer yeah ricky had the one thing he could do is like you know how joe waltz just chunks away and has really great rhythm mm. ricky has soul <laughs> I met Ricky. I was in a band with the Wild Cherry uh, guitar player singer that, that wrote and sang, played that funky music white. And we're playing up in Erie, um, Geneva on the lake, in Lake Erie. And we're backing up the coasters the whole summer. Uh, Parisi, it, it, he and the drummer did not get along at all. And, you know, we'd wear tuxedos and this and that. We're backing up the coasters the whole summer. So we get a break, come home, and I go. And, and Parisi quits, right? He's going to start uh, Wild Cherry. He asked me to go. And I said, you know, this is the first band I was ever making any money in. So I think I'm going to stay where I'm at. So he started another band. And I came home on a break and went over to Weirton, which is right across the river where Ricky lives. And he was working at a music store. And I just went to the music store. I didn't know Rick. Walked in a music store. And if you ever, if you knew Rick, every time he plays an acoustic guitar or something and he's not recording he's on his knees on the floor playing so i walk in there's this guy blonde guy playing the guitar and he's playing the song ohio mm -hmm. now if you remember the song ohio nobody played it right the guitar part was never played perfectly it was very close he did he was doing it right i walked over to him and i said hey you're playing that the way it's supposed to be played and he said thanks <laughs> and I said, I'm Joe from so-and-so. And he went, oh, cool. I'm Rick. And I was like, so do you play? Do, I mean, do you play guitar? I mean, is that, you know, what you do? And he said, no, I'm a drummer. And yeah, I said, now, oh, now, what year is this? This is... Uh, 73, maybe? Yeah. No, no, no. This would have been 71. Okay. Four years okay. Four years before the first Crack the Sky album. Right. So I was like, you know, what? You know, uh, do you have an electric guitar? Yeah. You want to come and join the band? And he knew the, who the band was. And he was like, hmm, let me think about that. He was supposed, this is August. He was supposed to leave for college. But no, he, this was July. He was supposed to leave for college at the end, first year of college at the end of August. But you wanted him right? to join as a guitar player, even though he said yeah. he was a drummer. And there is a video out there of him playing a snare drum later on in life i think with b.e taylor i'm like holy crap yep. what can't this yep. guy do right right so he became our guitar player now we told him don't ever buy a tuxedo don't ever get the tuxedo we hate wearing tuxedos we don't want it because now we're starting to get into like cool music you know rock music and uh so the drummer now hated him because he wouldn't buy tuxedo but it was our plan so that group broke up what happened was we we formed a group called east we went on the road we started playing everywhere getting out and 
you know, it was really, really cool the first time going on the road. And um, uh, we came back and, you know, that band actually lived together in Weird. So we would play all day, just practice and play all day. And, the, and I can tell you, I saw Rick learn how to play guitar. I mean, really play guitar. And most of it was from the Allman Brothers Live at the Fillmore. Wow. That A minor seventh is where he started. And he started doing that so good. And then we just, we fed each other about being good. So we had that band. So we got, we got this rehearsal place at the basement of a daycare center. And Ricky at this point had been, he had met JP, John, mm -hmm. and he kept telling us about him. And we were looking for like a uh, foreigner type singer, right? Somebody with that kind of high range. And, you know, we're like, yeah, you know, we didn't think about how we were going to write the songs. We figured we'd do something. We'll figure it out. And uh, Rick said, you know, why don't I bring John down? Like, yeah. And I remember it to this day. I'm sitting here. Joey D'Amico sitting to my right. Uh, John is, is standing up there with his acoustic guitar. I got Jimmy, everybody around. Ricky was over here. And the first thing he did was play, started playing ice. Da 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 Boom, boom, boom. And it worked in that 6 8. And uh, that was the first song I heard. And I was like, holy cow. And then, you know, we were like, well, well does he, is he going to be our writer or in the band? And so we weren't sure what we were going to do, whatever. And at that point, he and Ricky and Joey D'Amico were out playing three piece and they were doing Zeppelin stuff and stuff like that. But they had gone to New York and they met Terry Minogue. And it came back, and Ricky called and said, "Listen, man, we got to get this band together because, you know, they they liked our stuff." Well, then Jim Croce died, right? And we got a call, and it was like, "You guys need to come to New York and start making records." So I, I was a year and a half in the steel mill, and uh, walked over to see my dad, who was a foreman, and wait, said, "Wait, wait, wait, go back a little bit. You said Jim Croce died? Yeah. What did that have to do so with he you was, guys?" Well, he was with the same label. I mean, he was a Cash West Productions who became Life Song. So oh. when he died, yeah. So, so Life Song needed a new act. Yeah. Oh, and they okay. had Henry Gross. Henry Gross had the hit Shannon, but he didn't have it till after we got there. Right. And they had some other artists. And um, so I go to see my dad, and I said, Dad, you know, I get contacted by the people who do Jim Croce and want us to come to New York and start making records. And now I always get emotional here, but uh, he said, you got a year and a half in the mill, six months more and you're in the union and they can't touch you. And at that time, a, a job in the steel mill, a career in the steel mill, you'd have a pretty good retirement when you got done. When you work 45, 50 years and then have like, you know, 10 years of retirement or whatever and um and i said yeah dad but how about what if how am i gonna live with what if and uh, he said <clears throat> you're a grown man do whatever you want to do but whatever you do do it good and i still remember that um he's passed away since but mm -hmm. You know, I carried that with me, and uh, and so I just really dug in, and uh, that's that's you know playing with John. He would sit, he would play piano like I don't know how he did it, but his his sister is one of my best friends in the world, and, and later on she told me a story like she was taking piano lessons, and she was stuck on this part, and JP was getting tired of her of hearing this and he came out of the bedroom sat down and went it goes like this and went back in the bedroom 
And I never asked him about that. Like, you know, how did you do that? But he would go, he'd be playing like, like uh, C epic or something on piano. And I'd be sitting at his left hand with my bass. And I go, well, where are you at there? And he went, I don't know, this, this note. And it was like an F. Like, okay. Well, you know, he didn't really, he's not that kind of technical guy or whatever, you know. But somehow he knows how to, and he played it with great piano etiquette and emotion. And, uh, and that kind of drew me in. I have two songs that are like 20 minute songs mm -hmm. that are so prog, never got on a record. They are so prog and so good. I've been begging JP. Listen. Wait, wait a minute. Never got on a record or never got on a Crack the Sky record? So I called JP and you know I'm like this is like five years ago. JP, we got to do this, man. We got, you know, the fans got to hear this. They got to hear what you were writing back then. You know, yeah. this is this is part of our history. Oh, Mac, you know I got so many things going on. <laughs> it was like, yeah, I know, I know, no. So I'm still on that on that boat. Like if we ever get a chance, the, the one's called Anxiety Hall and one's called uh, High Mass. So these are early Crack the Sky songs. 20 minutes each. Oh, my God. Got to get them out there. <laughs> Got to get them out there. Got to hear it. And they have those kind of beats like Ice to like uh, Anxiety Hall goes, doom, 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 boom, ba, boom, 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 ba, boom, boom, boom. And it's yeah. just like this this uh, dreamy kind of crazy song, you know, and it's about depression. And then you sink into Anxiety Hall. You feel very small. And then that just... And uh, Jethro Tull was an influence back then too, and JP was playing acoustic guitar like Ian Anderson. Oh, I could be a hero. How did you guys eventually whittle down to the, the members that were on that first album? Well, here's what happened. So I met with my dad. My dad says, "Go ahead, mm -hmm. do it." Uh, everybody else, a couple guys were married, uh -huh. and JP said, well, "We're going to New York. Whoever can't go." Don't go. Right. Whoever can go, can go. Right. So that's who went. Me, Jimmy, Sticks, and Joey D'Amico, and Ricky and John. Because they had some attention. So we went to this bowling alley, and I was kind of learning how to engineer them. We hung two SM58 microphones from the ceiling, mm -hmm. had a real, real deck, and we just played. And we sent that to Life Song, and they were like, oh, my God, so come up to New York. When you went into the uh, studio... For the first album, you had all the material written. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. And probably Plus more. more. Right, right. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay, so you, you go in and, and do that first album. Very well received. Yeah. Rave reviews on a national it's still, level. It's still top 50 all time in, in Rolling Stone. And, and rightfully so. I mean, it's incredible. Maybe I can make everybody believe. My dad used to keep track of uh, everything, and I inherited a big box of Crack the Sky stuff. And so the radio and records, you know, the reporting on who, what stations playing what songs, we were be being played more than Steely Dan, yeah. more than every, all of our competitors. Like, yeah. we had a little bit of a commercial edge going, too. They, they really wanted us to be a vocal group, you know, right. singing group. And... Uh, it, it, and then it was like, so you're in Colorado. Ah, you're going to go buy a Crack Sky album. Uh, no, we don't have that. Well, you're not going to say, well, order me one. You're right. going to just go buy another album because there's three records you want right. to buy anyhow. Yeah? Right. Right. So, now, yeah, the, it just turned it, out that way. Let's lift our hearts up. Let's let our hair down. Now, the second album. Um, Rangers. Right. Well, right. I mean, yeah. No, but 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 let's talk about that because I read somewhere that you guys wanted to make a concept album about Mounties, Canadian Mounties. John's idea. And I mean, that's uh, that's so out there, but you guys could have pulled it off, and then it ended up only being one song. I mean, what did you guys say to him when he said, "Let's do a concept album about Canadian we, Mounties"? We were totally behind him because it was artsy. I mean, it was art, you know. Yeah. And it was like, yeah, okay. And they played us some of the songs. We were like, yeah, absolutely. You know, so we put that arrangement to Rangers. I haven't heard Rangers at Midnight, the song, in ages. But I remember really liking the whatever we did. How, 
how come John left before you guys went and recorded the third album? He got such critical acclaim on the first uh, couple records that Life Song felt like, you know, that he could compete with Randy Newman and stuff, which he certainly can. Um, again, I don't know what happened. He had George Martin's team produce the record and stuff like that. And um, he, he, he felt like that he wanted to move on. And I'm sure there was some spats going on and, yeah, whatever. And, you know, I remember one day he came in and said, so what are the, what are the monkeys doing today? <laughs> I was like, that's the wrong thing to say. <laughs> yeah. I remember getting mad at that, and I flipped my cigarette, and we're like, what are you talking about, man? Yeah, that's all stuff, you know, that, that's gone by and stuff like that. So he, it, it was John. He he wanted to be a solo artist, and he should be a solo And he kind of is a solo artist. Yeah. He's, these are these are John Palumbo records with Crack the Sky guys playing, yeah. you know? I mean, and I mean it in the best way, yeah. you know, because he should be a solo artist, yeah. you know. And even look at his body of work. Holy cow. Well, he's probably done 30 records since then. You better hold up. Hold up. And so we couldn't find a singer after John left. And we're like, Ricky goes, let me just mention a name to you. Gary Chap. Mm -hmm. You think he can handle it? He was like, I don't know. I, like, I really like Gary. He's a great guy and everything. Mm -hmm. We brought him up. He went straight into the studio at Lay Studio mm -hmm. and started singing. Right. And Rob Stevens was producing. And Nick Lagona was the engineer who did Rush and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I heard Gary sing. I was like, holy Toledo. And back then, everybody was tripling everything. Right. Guitars, everything but bass. Tripled. Right. His voice was just sounding beautiful. And, and that was it. And so we went out on the road with Gary. And it just it worked. You yeah. know, and that was that was the best musical uh, part of Crack the Sky, mm -hmm. live playing during with Gary, right? Uh, because we've been on the road for so long and we got so tight mm -hmm. that you know musically, yeah, it, it just worked. And we played the arena in Baltimore, mm -hmm. uh, and John wasn't in the band then, but he was at the show. Um, Boston. And Fog Hat opened for us. I so you guys headlined. At Fog, the yeah, at the so Civic Fog Center. Hat comes out first, mm -hmm. and you know they're full for the city. They had a hit, right. and then Boston comes out, and they, and they're doing uh, more than a feeling. And a, and a promoter's standing. I'm on the side of the stage, and I said, I don't know how we ended up third on this bill, mm -hmm. but that more than a feeling's killing. He yeah. said, just watch. Yeah. Just watch. Yeah. We, went out, we went over really good. And the band was tight then, too. So Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, we had some of those really great moments that you just never forget. I owe my soul to the company store. We were on strike at that time. That's when the fourth album, The Live Sky, came out. Right. We had met with our attorneys, who was Carr's attorneys, and they said, look, if you go double platinum on your next LP, you you will break even. You'll be able to pay back your debt to them. Okay. To life Which song. Is, yeah, eighty thousand, hundred thousand dollars per record. You'll be able to pay that back to them, but you won't make any money. You're still going to wow. be under the same contract. Well, what do we do? Go home. They have such an investment in you that they will have to renegotiate. Okay. Uh, over the years, somebody said that it, that I'm the one that had most to do with it. I had nothing to do with it except I was in the room and we all said, oh, okay. We didn't want to do that. We came back to our hometowns, moved back in with our parents. And um, and this is after the third album. Not That's correct. So, And then it was the record company that rele released Live Sky. They remixed it and everything and not to be critical of them, but you know, I used uh, Moog bass pedals a lot right. and they didn't even have that track in there. And a lot wow. of times it was counterpoint with the bass, blah, 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 you know, that kind of stuff. And so you only heard half of the bass part on certain songs and stuff. And, and you know, it was like, yeah, it was done at the Hit Factory by, with Bruce Turgeson and Terry Minogue, who's one of my best friends and an incredible arranger. He was our George Martin. Mm -hmm. You know, he did our strings and we just loved it. White music in the street. 
you guys go on strike because of the record company. Mm-hmm. Now, why was it that when Crack the Sky reformed, none of you guys were there? It was I know that John and Ricky and maybe <laughs> yourself helped write the songs for white music, but when they went out to play, it was John Palumbo with John Tracy and Carrie Ziegler and Bobby Hurd and um, Vince DePaul. Danny. Did you guys just kind of give up on the Crack the Sky thing because of the uh, financial obligations of the record company? or I mean, what happened there? What happened there, to be honest with you, is this. Ricky's going, to, I think he's doing a John Palumbo record, whatever. I didn't ask him that much about it, but he was going out there quite a bit to do it. But he was back for all the B.E. Taylor gigs, and we were doing good, and we were making records. And um, when White Music came out, and I realized, wait a minute, this is a Crack the Sky record they were doing. And I, and I didn't know that. And did Rick know that? And so now you start getting into all this, wait a minute, you know, did I read this all wrong? Was I wronged? I got a, a resume together. And I had been volunteering at a local television station just to learn, you know, uh, audio for tv and uh i had an interview went down and a guy was from ohio that hired me and he said i said i don't know if i can do this man i'm, I'm not that good of an engineer i'm just starting out and he said you're from ohio right i said yeah he said i'm from kent ohio people down here don't want to work you'll be fine and so he took me under his wings and uh and i started engineering so I kind of got out of the crack the sky thing. I just kind of lost lost my interest in it, and you know, because I felt like, well, it's a whole different thing now. They got a new bass player, drummer. Nobody asked me to be in the band, and if they did, I probably would have said no anyway. It was just a really weird time. It was a very disappointing time, you know, because we had worked so hard and 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 uh, nothing seemed to be going right except when we were on stage. B.E. Taylor, where does that fit into with Crack the Sky? Did you guys immediately start B.E. Taylor after Safety in Numbers? We auditioned Bill for the third album. Mm -hmm. And B.E. is such a good singer. We were like, that's it. This is the guy. Comes to contract time. His attorney says, if you sign this, you're going to blow your whole career. Mm -hmm. So he didn't sign. That's when we got Gary. Um. after that, when we came back, it was like, hey, you still want to play with B.E.? Yeah. So me and Joey D'Amico started. We were playing in a band at that point with Jimmy Griffiths. Me, Joey, and Jimmy Griffiths had a band called Sugar. Me and Joey D'Amico started um, with B.E. Taylor, and then I kept calling Rick. Because Rick was staying in New York with his girlfriend, who became his wife. And I was like, Rick, you got to come back. you got to come back. All right, man, but, you know, I can't be there. I'll, I'll try it for a couple months. He came back, and he became friends with B.E. He was just one of the nicest, genuine human beings you could imagine. Um, and we all just became friends and got along. And our band was pretty good. And then we got a record deal with uh, um, MCA, and then it became CBS and put some records out. None of us ever saw any money from that until the day B.E. died. He, he tried to get the the uh, rights to that music back or something. We never we never got any royalties. In fact, we never even got any writer's royalties, let alone publishing, because we had given that all up. How does that and, happen? Because the little bit of research I've done into B.E. Taylor, you guys actually had a hit. Refresh my memory. What's the name of it? So I don't have to look. Vitamin L. Right, Vitamin, vitamin L. L. I've, I've watched the, um, the the video, and yeah. it was um, Joey actually sang that song. So yeah. B.E. Taylor was... Crack the Sky with a different singer and different keyboard player. Yeah. It's unbelievable to me that you guys never saw a penny because you, you, you found success with B.E. Taylor. Well, we had the number one. Vitamin L was number one in Pittsburgh. Right. And um, they still play it at the uh, stadium, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember it, hearing it at Hammerjacks. I didn't know it was you guys. It, it doesn't <laughs> doesn't sound like Crack the Sky at all. No more heroes, no heroes, no heroes. 
Crack the Sky, let me think, in 1984 was playing the Philadelphia Spectrum. And they were, yeah, you weren't in the band at this time. This this was the uh, John Tracy, Kerry Ziegler, Bobby Hurd line up with Vince DePaul on keyboards with John. So they're playing the Philadelphia Spectrum and they are sent notification that Life Song Records filed bankruptcy. And then that made Crack the Sky implode. And then, so John leaves the band again to go do solo stuff. This is late 84. This is October, November. Okay, so he goes to go back to do um, uh, solo stuff. But the rest of the band stayed together and started playing around Maryland and Baltimore as the band No Heroes. Now the, I remember. Yeah, now their very first job was at a place out in Westminster called Staters Inn. And it just so happened I happened to be in the band that opened up for them on their first gig. And we had to share the dressing room. And uh, it was just the, the bar's um, kitchen. And Vinny DePaul was like, Jesus Christ, a week ago we were playing the Philadelphia Spectrum. Now this week we're playing yeah. Staters Inn. Our careers are going right in the toilet. <laughs> and now myself and the rest of the guys in my band, we're Crack the Sky fans. We're like, what the hell happened? He goes, Life Song Records filed bankruptcy. They couldn't even go so far as to buy us a pack of gum to support us anymore. And we, we needed that support to stay on the road, so the whole thing imploded. So wow, that, I didn't yeah. know they filed bankruptcy. Well, that's what that's what um, he told me that night that the record company had filed bankruptcy, and that's what I was getting into when I interviewed John. That you know, didn't Life Song Records go out of oh. uh, business in late '84? Now I don't know if they eventually worked their way out of bankruptcy, but that caused the uh, would have been the second time that John left Crack the Sky. Okay, and, yeah, and. Um, um, so we, we, you know, we opened up for him. We sat there and listened to him that night. But they played a lot of Crack the Sky songs, and they played um, a couple cover songs, and they also had worked up some new songs that were not Crack the Sky songs. And they started playing around Baltimore, like at Maxwell's and Capricorn. Mm -hmm. And um, but yeah, I was in the band that opened up for them. That's why I know that little bit of Crack the Sky history firsthand. You got the blue shining sky. Come around 2000, me and JP are talking on the phone every day. Mm -hmm. Hey, man, what's going on? Not much, man. We'd be drinking our coffee, just talking, laughing. Right. And uh, I, I don't know. So it, it just came out. They're like, yeah, you know, you want to come back in the band? Was, yeah, why not? You know, so I would just fly up and, and play those gigs from Dallas. And that's how that started. And then because I was an engineer and all that, you know, I kind of just gravitated to that. Okay, let's um, solve a, a big mystery for many Crack the Sky fans. Whatever happened uh -oh. to Jim Griffiths? Jim Griffiths is one of my best friends, just like all the other guys. When you spend that kind of time with people, and you're that close, and it's you against the world, and mm -hmm. every good band out there, it's like you become really, really close. And... Mm -hmm. You know, Jimmy ended up in California, and, and uh, he's still there. And so, does he play music? Um, he no, you know. And and I I contacted him I don't know, ten fifteen years after that, and he said, Joe, oh, oh, King Friday record, yeah, I want him to do the intro to uh, let the song begin, the first the title track, or the the first song of the record. He said, Joe, I haven't played in 15 years. I, my guitars are under the bed, and I'm afraid to open the case that they'll stink. Right. And, and I said, well, listen, you, I'm, I'm going to wait for you. Mm -hmm. You've got to be on this record. You've got to, because he did the nuclear apathy intro. Okay. That's, that's Jimmy. And I, and I wanted that on there. So take your time. He called me a couple of times. I can't do this. I can't do this. Well, I had interviewed out at uh, Fox in L.A. Mm -hmm. A good friend of mine is the head guy there, and we worked in Dallas. We were just a really good team on the mm -hmm. SSLs, and he taught me a ton about the SSL. And he, uh, I contacted him. I said, hey, man, you mind if I send uh, Jimmy Griffiths over to play an acoustic guitar part? Nah, send him over. So once Jimmy was ready, he was real nervous. He went over and Bruce called me. Said one take. He did it. I got two takes, but he did it in one take. It was perfect. Mm -hmm. So then he started playing again. And then uh, uh, jumping way ahead, he came over to the house, and uh, I played him some of the record. 
in, in my acoustic was sitting. He said, you mind if I play your acoustic? I said, no. He started playing If I Only Had a Brain. <laughs> and I was like, we got to put that on this album, man. He was like, oh, man, I don't know, you know. I said, come on, just lay the guitar part down. And then he was making some mistakes. And he said, look, I'm going to go back home to California, and I'll come back in a, in a couple of weeks. Let me practice. So, and he did. He came back. I did whatever he said to do. And uh, I played some drums and bass, and he sang everything and played guitar and all that. And uh, so I, it was a joy having Jimmy back, you know, and, and the fact that I encouraged him to, to play again, you know. And uh, he's, he, hopefully when this COVID thing's done, he'll be back and we'll work together some more. Where's Gary Lee Chapel these days? Gary Lee Chapel's in Maryville, Tennessee. He married into this really great family. He's got all kind of grandkids and everything. And um, So he's out of the music business totally. He sang in a gospel group, and then he came back and sang on, um, what was it? Alive and Kicking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He came back and, and touched up some vocals at my house in Dallas. I had a studio okay. in the house there. Okay. Yeah. Seems like that original lineup from that first album, you guys are all friends, and that, that really does my heart good to hear that. Yeah, you know, when, you, when you're in Mesquite, Texas, and the subsidy money runs out, there's no subsidy, we didn't get the check from the record company, and we're keeping up with people that are making, like, you know, they're doing arenas. We're opening for them for, like, two grand, and they're making, like, whatever, half a million dollars or whatever. We need subsidy to be able to chase these. They're flying, and we're driving all over the country and stuff. So we're stuck. We're in Mesquite, and our, our road manager was named Danny Palumbo, not related to John, but they had gone to Marshall University together. And uh, uh, he's from New Jersey, and there's uh, John. I had no check that came in, so we're just kind of stuck. And there was pink flamingos in the uh, lawn of the hotel which I guess maybe is where Pink Flamingo came from. But uh, uh, when, you're, when you're stuck in a town and, you know, stuff like that, it, it's like you're together. You know, it's a, I mean, you live together. You just, you know, you, you can't separate that stuff. You can get bitter. You can get all kind of crazy. Jim, Jimmy, Jimmy has been a bit like, no, man, I don't want to tell you. you know, I don't, no, no, no. I'm like, Jimmy, we're getting older, man. You know, it's like B.E. died. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like you know, Chick died. That was the sax player mm -hmm. of the Seven Piece Band. Uh, once one of us go, we can never recreate anything. You know, Man. it's over. And, uh, and and he's he's loosened up a lot. You know, so we all have had bitterness about things. You know, and not anymore. Jeez, I really love these guys. You mm -hmm. know, and like uh, we got to get back there. So I I've been and Ricky have been a driving force in trying to get everybody together. So this summer, I, I want to get everyone down here to Steubenville mm -hmm. and sit around and tell stories. Yeah. I mean, what could be more fun than that? And I got a ton of stories.